please hang on to that book and turn to reading number 468. Join me in that responsive reading. We need one another when we mourn and would be comforted. When we are in trouble and afraid, we need one another when we are in despair, in temptation, and need to be recalled to our best selves again. When we would accomplish some great purpose and cannot do it alone, we need one another in the hour of success when we look for someone to share our triumphs. We need one another in the hour of defeat when with encouragement we might endure and stand again. We need one another when we come to die and would have gentle hands prepare us for the journey. All our lives we are in need and are in need of us. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to speak to you this morning about something that I think is pretty controversial. I mean, at least I think I'm pretty outside the mainstream. Uh, and the reason I know that is as I watch and listen to other people, it seems like no one agrees with me on this. And as a matter of fact, when I watch and listen to myself, it seems like I don't agree with myself on this sometimes. I, I catch myself not, uh, not following my own advice. So the thing I want to talk about is this, and you had it before, that we need to stop talking about what people deserve, what I deserve, what you deserve, what somebody else deserves, and instead we need to talk about what we need, what I need, what you need, what somebody else needs. I just want to challenge you to try that for a day. Just try to catch every time you talk about what somebody deserves or what somebody doesn't deserve or what you deserve or what you don't deserve. And just ask yourself, what am I saying? Where did that come from? I think the problem is that generally speaking, when we talk about what we or somebody else deserves, it doesn't make sense. It's kind of coming out of left field. It's a way that we use to kind of justify something we feel without actually saying what the criteria are for why we deserve it. And by the way, when I say we, I should just kind of stop for just a second and say, I'm kind of talking about the dominant narrative, okay? It's not that there aren't some of us who are trying really hard to swim upstream, but the world around us, the air we breathe, the, the, the stream we're swimming in, is really pushing in a particular direction. And when we talk about deserving, just think of times you hear about people saying somebody deserves something. I actually have a relative who just recently moved into a multi-million dollar house. But he said, oh yeah, but he deserves it. He really worked hard. It's like, well, that's an interesting concept. Like, how hard did he work? <laughs> I actually figured it out. Somebody who makes a million dollars a year is making about $480 an hour, which would be like 64 times minimum wage. Now, are the people making a million dollars a year working 64 times harder than the person working at Burger King or the person working at the daycare center? We just kind of have this thing. I think the problem is we've been captivated by capitalism. And the dominant narrative the morality of capitalism is you deserve what you can get. If you can get it, you must deserve it. And if you couldn't get it, you must not have deserved it. You must not have earned it. You're going to get what you're worth. And I think that actually flies right in the face of all of our religious traditions. I don't think worth comes from, actually even if it did, comes from just working harder. We often say that you know, you're rewarded for being smart. Well, that's not a virtue. And besides that, I don't know about you, I've met some fairly wealthy people. They're not much smarter than we are. 
Matter of fact, some of them are amazingly not smarter than we are. <laughs> People I've met. That's not it. I don't think they're cleaner. I don't think they're kinder. I don't think they're more humble. This whole concept of deserving, we need to just stop and take a look at. We even need to watch out when we talk about poor people. On the other end, you have the deserving poor and the non-deserving poor. Okay? We're really quick to slap people into one of those categories. They're able-bodied, right? We've got to test them. We've got we to be sure that they're looking for a job if they're able-bodied. So nobody's saying we're going to actually look into their traumas. We're going to look into their mental health. We're going to look into their family situation. We're going to look into all kinds of other things. We're very quick to say, aha, he doesn't deserve it. Look at that. He's walking. Why does he deserve any help from somebody else? We're very quick to move from, to deserving and undeserving. My own, as you probably caught from the introduction, my own religious tradition, my own faith tradition is Roman Catholic. And I was struck when I was thinking about this that the first principle of the Unitarian Universalists, make sure I got this right here, is the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. Our worth, our value is inherent. In my tradition, Catholic social teaching, the first most important part of Catholic social teaching is the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. And our tradition would say it's because we're beloved children of God. It's not something we earned. It's not something we deserve. It's not something that we've gained through some goodness of our own. We just are that way because we're human beings. It's not because we worked hard. It's not because we're smart. It's not because of our pristine mental health. Our worth, our dignity comes from being human. Actually, if we don't gain, if we don't earn our dignity, we also can't lose it. We can't give it away. Try though we might. If we didn't earn it in the first place, if we didn't deserve it in the first place, we can't forfeit it. So I want you to kind of ponder that for just a second here. If we can't forfeit it, it means we can't give away our right to have health care, our right to have a place to live, our right to live a decent human life. Often enough, when something bad happens, we look for who to blame, right? One of my favorite Bible stories comes from the Gospel of John. They bring him a man who was born blind. And the question they ask Jesus is they say, whose fault is this? Is it because he sinned or is it because his parents sinned? What did he do to deserve this? And it's really kind of interesting that in that, Jesus doesn't even answer the question. He actually says, it's not his sin, it's not his parents' sin, it's so the glory of God can be shown. And by that he means, so we can heal him. And then he goes about and heals the guy. The point being, it's not about what does he deserve, it's about what does he need. It's not about who caused this, whose fault is it, but what does he need and who can help? Those are the questions we need to ask. So as was mentioned, a lot of the work we do in, uh, in Micah and in Wisdom is around the need for reform in the criminal justice system. And I believe that at the heart of the shame that is our mass incarceration system is this faulty thinking about asking what do people deserve instead of asking what they need. I'm just going to run you real quick, a super quick review of why we put people in prison. Okay, why the criminologists tell us there's four reasons you can put people, you, you lock people up. The first is particular deterrence. Okay, Mike has run amok. We'd better get him off the street before he hurts somebody else. Okay, particular deterrence. And some, to some extent, that's what we use our prisons for, but not much. Name is, you know, there's people in our prisons with stage four cancer. We've got people in their 70s and 80s in our prisons. We've got people who are no danger to anybody other than themselves, yet we lock them up. So it's not just about particular deterrence. If it was about particular deterrence, we would actually imprison people for a really short period of time and we put them in a treatment program so that they would stop hurting themselves or other people. So that's not what we're doing. The second reason they give, you've got particular deterrence, the second one they give you is general deterrence. 
We're going to make an example out of Mike, okay? We're going to lock him up, and everybody else is going to say, ooh, I better not do that. The problem with that is that it doesn't work. It just doesn't. I actually talked one time to a legislator, and he got mad at me. I said, do you really think somebody who's about to rob the convenience store checks the state statutes? To find out, let's see, am I going to get 15 years or 25 years for this? If it's 15, it's worth the risk. If it's 20, nobody does that. Most of the people in our prisons have significant substance abuse issues and have significant mental health issues. They're not sitting down doing a cost-benefit analysis. So that's general deterrence. The third, so you had particular deterrence, general deterrence. The third one we give is rehabilitation. And that's actually why we get nice names, like the Green Bay Correctional Facility, right? It's not for punishment, it's for correction. The problem is we just don't do it. We've given up on that a long time ago. Our prison and jail system is not set up to rehabilitate people. It's set up to punish people. And that's the fourth reason. You had particular deterrence, general deterrence, rehabilitation, and the fourth one is punishment. And I would just posit that punishment is actually a theological issue. It's not really a sociological issue. It's not about keeping us safe. It's not about doing the rational thing. It's about saying, what does he deserve? Okay, and you see, watch the news sometime, you know. So-and-so just got a slap on the wrist. He deserved more than that. Well, why? Who made that decision? When we talk about what people deserve, one I thought was the most interesting studies I ever looked at was a thing that said that judges tend to give sentences in multiples of six. Six months or 12 years or 24 years or 18 months or whatever. There's nothing in the statute that says they should do that. It's just kind of the way people's brains work. It has nothing to do with what's the difference between somebody who got 12 months and 18 months. What's the difference between 10 years and 12 years? There's no anywhere rational calculation of that because it's based on punishment. And it's based on how much do I want this person to suffer as opposed to what does he need or what does she need in order to get better, in order to come back out. I just want to say a real quick word. This whole idea of punishment and this whole idea of deserving is also why we have the racial disparities we have. Because it's so subjective. And in every step along the way, implicit bias rears its ugly head. Whether or not we want to, again, we live in a world, the stream we live in, even if we're trying to swim upstream, is racist. And it says, people of color are dangerous. It says, People who kind of look like me seem like me. People who kind of look like my relatives must be a nice kid who made a mistake. People who don't look like me. And again, people aren't thinking this. It just happens to us because it's the world we live in. It's the air we breathe. And since we don't have a rational way to make these decisions, it's based on what comes along. And this is everybody from police officers to prosecutors to judges to prison personnel to parole officers. We're all subject to it. We get these ever-increasing things because it's, we're basing it on what do they deserve. I just want to say, what if we approached people? When they arrested somebody, the first question was, what does this guy need? What does this person need in order to be healthy? What does this person need in order to actually be okay? What if that was what the purpose was of our whole justice system? was to say, let's take everybody and see what they need. I'm going to give you an example where some of my own advice is hard for me to take. If I look at situations like, say, police officers who shoot an unarmed African-American kid, what's my first response? They should send that guy to jail for a long time. And then I think, whoops, wait a minute. <laughs> That's not apparently what I believe. Or what do I think, you know, I, I, I can get all grumpy and upset and say, you know, the whole housing crisis that we're still paying for that hurt so many people, nobody went to prison for that. Well, it's true, but what if I actually, I started to look at both of those situations and said, what do they need? 
What does that Wall Street banker need in order to actually become a human being with some compassion for other human beings who worries about other folks? What do they need in order to get there? Maybe that police officer doesn't belong having a gun, a little particular deterrence there, but what does that person need in order to actually become what we need them to be? And I don't think it's just that we need them to suffer. I don't think that actually makes anybody better. Sometimes people will say, well, you guys, all this stuff, what about the victims? What about the victims of crime? You know what? Nobody's asking them what they need either. Matter of fact, we're building our justice system on the assumption that what victims of crime need is the satisfaction of knowing that the person who hurt them is suffering. And in fact, people I know who work in restorative justice often say what victims of crime need is for the person who hurt them to actually see them as a human being. To understand, how could, I have, how could you have seen me this way? What they need is actually healing themselves. Seeing the perpetrator just suffer more and more doesn't actually help people be better. What we need to do is people who suffer crimes, we actually need for them to be healed. And you know what? Most of the people in our prisons were victims of crimes a long time before they ever committed a crime. If we actually said, what did they need right then? Maybe we could have actually changed the trajectory of somebody's life. It's hard to do, okay? There's a part of us that immediately somebody hurts you and you want to hurt them back. But if we could actually change our thinking and say, stop saying, what do they deserve? And say, what do they need? What do I need? Not what do I deserve, what do I need? That we might actually start to change the way we look at things. I'm not saying there shouldn't be any consequences, okay? When somebody's ill, if they have a contagious disease, they might have to be quarantined. It's the same way. Yeah, we need to be rational. We need to understand that we need to, sometimes we need to be protected uh, from people who are very damaged. But we need to say, how can we help those people become less damaged? Not how can we hurt them more? How can we do more damage to them and then expect them to get better? Actually, the amazing thing, and I think I'm overrunning my time here, but I think the amazing thing is we have people, I have the privilege of working with a lot of former prisoners, uh, people who were, actually, I shouldn't say that, people who were formerly incarcerated. And it's amazing how many of them actually have, despite the justice system, kind of become amazing people. Human beings are remarkably resilient. Human beings have a remarkable capacity. But we don't help people get better. We don't help people transform by putting them in solitary confinement and driving them to the edge of losing their mind, or often right over that edge. We don't make people better by keeping them away from their loved ones, by denying them an opportunity to learn, by denying them an opportunity to grow. So I think it all starts, and I think it all starts with each of us. Because again, even though we might not want to, just catch yourself. How often today do you say what somebody deserves or what somebody doesn't deserve? I mean, it happens all the time. I'm, you know, in my office, the woman I work with most closely is always telling me, you really deserve a day off. It's like, no, no, no. What you should be saying to me is, you're driving us crazy. <laughs> you need to go away. <laughs> Your anxiety is not helping anybody here. <laughs> It would actually help if we started thinking that way all around. Stop talking about what we deserve. Start talking about what we need. Thank you.